Welcome. I'm Glenn Anderson with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. This TV series explores a variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolent social change. This month's program explores the power and the practicality of nonviolence. We'll clear up some common misconceptions and we'll tackle some hard questions. Our guest is Glenn Gersmel. He has decades of very impressive accomplishments for nonviolence and peace. He taught and did grassroots organizing for 10 years in some of the highest crime areas of New York City and Oakland, California. Uh, he played a crucial role in getting Congress to pass the ban on chemical weapons. He's written and published extensively. He was one of two dozen delegates from around the world invited to India to help plan the United Nations Decade for Peace and Nonviolence. He earned a master's degree in conflict and security from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. And for a number of years, he's been working hard as the national coordinator of the Lutheran Peace Fellowship, which is based in Seattle and serves the whole nation. He's also an active member of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Welcome, Glenn. It's good it's to have you here. great to be here. We have an all Glenn program here on the, this time. So, uh, um, we want to talk about nonviolence, and a lot of people just have some, some pretty common misconceptions. They think that nonviolence sounds nice and sweet and ethical, but they wonder if it's really up to the challenge of getting the hard work done, of actually changing things, uh, if it's practical in, in the real world. How would you address that concern? Well, nonviolence is actually more powerful and has a broader menu of possible strategies and ways of approaching a conflict than violence does. It's a much more useful and much more effective method of dealing with, with issues on every level. I mean, as a parent, and I have a seven-year-old, um, uh, nonviolence can, can be enormously helpful in helping us engaged a child in a way that's more helpful and, and produces better results than the way most of us were raised, where um, if you got out of line, you were misbehaving and, and you were subjected to a slap or strong words or whatever. Nonviolence is all about the way I treat my coworkers, my supervisor, my relatives, that the, the relative I have the most trouble getting along with. Um, as well as international issues or racial justice issues or the larger kinds of picture. And I know one of the, one of the parts that f people sometimes find surprising is, like, how did I handle situations where I was this close to guns or knives, which happened mm -hmm. dozens and dozens of times in New York and Oakland. And I actually, like Martin Luther King, carried a gun for a while. And like Martin Luther King, I, I finally realized this is not only a really bad idea because you're more likely to mm -hmm. draw a higher level of violence to yourself if mm -hmm. someone no believes or thinks mm -hmm. you might be armed. But it's also just really an ineffective way of handling conflicts on the street. It's, you are very rarely in better shape by having access to a weapon. Um, and uh, even like the lunch program that I volunteer with now, um, every couple months I'll help deal with a fight. And my challenge is actually as a male to sort of back off and not pro project too much power, but to create a space that is a little softer, that allows the conflict to, to sort of reduce itself in terms of the energy that's involved. And I've succeeded in taking knives away from people with that kind of a strategy where 
a lot of it is just really making sure that you're not crowding the person, and, but staying close enough that you're engaged. And it's almost like a keto or ballet or uh, you know tennis or something. I mean, there's a there's a kind of a game element almost in in how you position your body and how you use your voice and the how you pause before responding and and so forth. And it's really quite uh, quite fascinating to explore. So, and one of the other common misconceptions is that nonviolence means what you're just going to do nothing and let them roll all over us. You're going to let evil and and violence prevail. No. So how, how do you get how do you respond to that? Exactly. That's a really crucial misconception. Yeah, nonviolence is really a way of waging the struggle, but using different tools and different weapons, if you will. Mm -hmm. Notice how militarized yeah. our language is. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 not as re withdrawing from the conflict, but actually using a style that allows you to more effectively engage the conflict than violence does. Yeah, I talk about that in terms of changing the, the dynamics of it, uh, changing the power relationships. Right. And it's, it's a transformative thing exactly. that, that, uh, that uh, uh, works differently and, and works better. And because it doesn't rely on, on brute force, uh, nonviolence is really very accessible for people who might not be tough macho guys because of whatever reason, f exactly. whatever physical reason. Right. Uh, so it, it's it's a way to effectively engage people in whatever the conflict is, but but without doing it in a way that, that hurts people. Right. Exactly. Um, can can we um, lay out just a little bit of information, basically about what nonviolence is and, and what it's not? Um, we keep hearing ever since we we're like in school that there are two main ways of dealing with conflict. There's the, the you know, the fight or flight response. Right. And nonviolence is often talked about as being a third way. You're not fighting in a violent way. You're not running away. It's a third way that's creative and, and transformative. Uh, could you just address this, this third way right. concept? Right. Um, or maybe we already have, but yeah. if there's anything else to add. No, that's that's really the point. That it's and it, it's it's neither engaging nor withdrawing, but it's creatively engaging the issue in a way that actually allows you to to sort of hold close to it. Um, the Spanish word, for example, in Latin America, all over Latin America, they use uh, a phrase that for nonviolence that means roughly disciplined persistence or yeah, relentless relentless persistence. Is how I've heard it. Be a better translate. way, even yeah. yes. And, uh, and that's really what nonviolence is. I mean, the definition of nonviolence doesn't sound like the opposite of violence. It's mm -hmm. really a kind of a persistent or disciplined yeah. or courageous goodwill, really. Mm -hmm. um, it's an active confrontation with a conflict or evil that seeks both to end the problem, but also to win over and to respect the human being or human beings that are mm -hmm. Your opponents, so it's very different from from the win lose kind of mentality that that undergirds the use of violence. Mm -hmm. It's really a win win kind of a strategy, and it it's has an amazing effect on the dynamic, as I think you alluded to before, in sort of deflating or reducing some of the the sort of escalation that happens in right. in conflicts typically. Yeah, I remember when when Gandhi was trying to help India become free from the British Empire, uh, he would say that he wanted the British to leave, but when they left, he wanted them to leave as friends, and he wanted them to leave because they would figured out that, that they were better off if they would leave, uh, which is a whole different thing from, from a violent uh, intent to just, just plain old defeat them right. and with no regard for the, the right. ensuing relationship. Right. Um, you mentioned when we, we talked on the phone to prepare for the program, and you mentioned uh, examples like you said in New York City, there's a, a five foot tall principal in a school uh, could stand up to some really unruly uh, students in ways that that uh, like a male teacher couldn't do. Right. And you mentioned some other examples. Um, right. You mentioned uh, women in East Los Angeles right. in pilgrimages around the neighborhood. Give, give us some stories about some right. of these interpersonal. Um, right. Methods. Yeah. The the that this uh, principle you're referring to was really an eye opener for me because I, I I had had some experience with violence and I I would watch her and just marvel at how this woman who 
you know, was a head shorter than these young males uh, in the high school, would would just move a conflict to a different level. And it's it's a kind of an image that I keep thinking of when I'm in a conflict or, or try to think of to, to try to remember what her magic was. And it was really respect and engagement and having a clear line of what was acceptable for her, but not making it a power play or a power trip in imposing that on the other person, but rather holding it out as the right thing to do and basically repeatedly inviting the opponent to, to conform to that and repeatedly listening intently to the person that was doing something that, that uh, was misbehavior. And she had just a much more successful uh, track record and much better relationships that she built. Well, what's this uh, story about the women in Los Angeles who would take pilgrimages around the yeah, neighborhood? They, it started out they were huddled in this room doing a Bible study and uh, um, just terrorized by the gang fighting that was going on. And one of the women said, you know, we just read this story about Jesus walking on the water and, and uh, I think we're being asked to step out of the boat, which is this safe place that we're in where we're huddling. And, and so they ended up going out and just doing this sort of pilgrimage, peregrinacion, around all through all of the different gang turfs, picking up people as they went. There were about 150 by the time they were out there for 45 minutes. A guitar was produced, salsa and chips emerged at one point. And uh, um, the police records show just an amazing reduction in violence in that period. They started doing it every single night, and it resulted in the formation of a group that produced a bakery, a child care center, and several other places that allowed the group to employ some of these gang members, and that's all they would hire, and, um, and uh, pr start producing a model of a different way of, of living in the community. And it, and it recognized these gang members as people and understood that the gang was really kind of a family for them. And if we're not out there offering them a different community or a different network, a different family, we're consigning them to the gang. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was amazingly effective, better, more effective than anything the police had tried. Mm -hmm. And they ended up um, really transforming their neighborhood. Mm. It makes you wonder how, how applicable that can be in communities like Olympia where some people are upset about homeless folks or other communities where they have uh, problems right. with the young people or whatever that may be. At the, at the international level, there's quite a lot of uh, history about this. And you told me on the phone that, uh, and I've read also uh, about uh, French women in 1871 and some other examples. Give it, tell us if you could just kind of briefly a couple of these Well, the examples French women from... is one of my favorite stories. It, several thousand French women marched out of the city before dawn, tired of the, their sons and husbands being killed in a fruitless war with Prussia, marched out of the city, stood in front of the cannons, and stopped the fighting. <laughs> and uh, Pam McAllister, who's written it up in one of her wonderful books of stories of women and nonviolence, um, actually tells a, a half a dozen related stories to that, where the women were really the engines of change and, and uh, repeatedly stopped the fighting or changed the dynamic along the lines of what we're talking about. And uh, you know, when you if you thought about it ahead of time without knowing their story, you'd think standing in front of the cannon, right? I mean, I'm not crazy, but in fact, the numbers of women and their very vulnerability and their determination together allowed them to do what seems preposterous, which is to put flesh and blood mm -hmm. in front of weapons of war and succeed. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the Philippine, in the Philippines, there was this, the Marcos dictatorship. Ferdinand right. Marcos was the, right. the dictator that the United States was supporting for years. Right, and, and a ruthless dictator. And really a nasty, nasty dictator. And, and he was overthrown by this people power movement. Right. That, right. Uh, and we know some of the people who were involved with that, right. some of the people from the FOR in this country that were helping out. Tell us just briefly about how that went. Well, um, the, I think the, one of the most interesting parts was when um, uh, Marcos was under a lot of pressure from, the, from people basically withdrawing their support from his regime, which is a crucial element of nonviolence in an international kind of setting. Um, and he finally ordered his soldiers to, to 
march against the, uh, the protesters. And there was a confrontation of a, a number of tanks, quite a few tanks actually, and soldiers with their bayonets fixed and holding machine guns and so forth. And the, the Filipinos would just walk up to the, the military hardware in a non-provocative way, but in a disciplined way and in a firm way. And they did it in a way that sort of reflected the community rather than reflected an armed enemy that you would shoot at. And these soldiers were just simply unprepared to just open fire because it, was, it wasn't an enemy that was coming toward yeah. them. It was their people, it yeah. was people. And despite repeated efforts by their higher ups to get them to fire um, or drop bombs or shoot cannon shells or even tear gas and smoke grenades, the, the soldiers just couldn't be forced, even with all of the, the, you know, the threats that came down in their heads, to, to open fire. There were, there were a few casualties, but nothing like what a war produces. Right. I mean, just a tiny fraction. Here in this country, the Civil Rights Movement is, is a great story of this, a great example. And, uh, you know, now for folks who are significantly younger than we are, they might not have a, a gut feel for how, how oppressive and how dangerous the situation right. was uh, in the South for, for African Americans who didn't know their place, right. didn't, who didn't stay subservient. Right. And uh, so wanting to integrate something, wanting to vote, any of these things could, could get you killed. And the, the nonviolent movement that, that arose here, and it wasn't just Martin Luther King, it was a lot of people in a right. lot of places, uh, that whole nonviolence movement for civil rights really, um, well, it transformed that whole, the whole society right. there. Right. And, and it was rooted in these same principles of nonviolence of transforming the situation and not being provocative like, like it would have been if they had guns. You think of like uh, a few years later in the riots in the cities that provoked this enormous white backlash in the North. But here, the Civil Rights Movement generated support from right. white Northerners. Right, which and that's was really crucial, crucial. In getting the and the and the civil rights laws passed. Right. Part of the the effectiveness of nonviolence is to is to see a broader picture than violence sees. Mm -hmm. Violence typically only sees the the armed opponent, mm -hmm. but nonviolence mm -hmm. understands that you can win a battle and lose a war. Right. If you don't understand uh, the bigger picture, which includes the public, the civilians, the governments that aren't involved in the conflict. Um, people that are watching it on TV elsewhere and so forth. Yeah, because when you watch it on TV and you see the, the police beating the crap out of somebody who just wants to vote right. or just wants to enroll in school and, and they bring out the police dogs and the, and the fire hoses and, and all that stuff, it's real clear who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. Right. And um, so it, it, it's, it's real clear. And, and, um, and you it's look, a lot of the power of nonviolence. Yeah, exactly you're, you're, that. you're playing to a larger audience, and 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 part of what they were doing with the civil rights movement was they were upholding the best values of what this country is about. So part of nonviolence, as I understand it, and when I talk with folks about it, is is we're holding on to those real good values, and whether it's the values that this country is, is founded on and sometimes only pays lip service to, but people really know that we, we support these values, or it's valuing their religious faith or their whatever that may be. And so part of the reason I think why the Bush regime is losing so much credibility in the, in the US and elsewhere is that the Bush regime in what they're doing with other countries and here is they're abandoning those values. Right. We're abandoning democracy, we're abandoning human rights. We, they want to torture, they want to do all these horrible things, and people can say, well, wait a minute, you're not upholding the, mm -hmm. upholding the real values. And so when a movement says we will uphold these real values, we just want to vote, we want to have equal rights for everybody, it's real clear for the whole public to see what's going on. And this did play to the rest of the world. And other liberation movements elsewhere in the world looked at the U.S. Civil Rights Movement and said, wow, there's a model, just like people here have looked at other models from elsewhere, Gandhi's India and so forth. Right. Um, 
you want to mention something about the South African resistance? You told me on the phone uh, just about how Mandela, Nelson Mandela, moved from part of a, a violent movement to. Um, Right. People don't realize that Nelson Mandela was actually in charge of the formation of the military wing of the African National Congress before, and that was part of the reason he was jailed yeah. for t several decades. And uh, it was while he was in jail, he continued to play a leadership role, um, and, and he, along with the country, gradually realized that nonviolence was ought to be considered, that violence wasn't working. I mean, after 20 years, you start thinking, is there another way? Mm -hmm. And at that point, Desmond Tutu and a lot of other people that had, had been thinking about these things began um, becoming more visible in the, in the leadership and putting forth a different model. And uh, I think the whole world was astonished that um, in just a handful of years, two or three or four years in terms of the, the, the leadership role, of course, there was a there was a long period of training and and development of nonviolence, but it was really a very short period of yeah. time in which nonviolence was demonstrated to be more powerful and right. more effective than violence was right. against a very repressive regime. Yeah, it was it was again people who don't remember what the the white racist South African government was like don't really brutal. don't realize how much they're up against. It was just really amazing. Well, a lot of people say that, that nonviolence works as long as your adversary is reasonably civilized. And they'll say, like, well, Gandhi versus the British Empire. Of course, the British were actually pretty brutal, too. But right. you've given some examples against brutal folks. And, um, uh, but it's been used against communist governments. I wonder if you could mention some examples. Sure. I mean, 12 of the 13 Eastern European countries fell with very little violence at all on the part of the protesters, almost n none in several of those mm -hmm. countries. Um, Marcos in, in the Philippines, uh, the East Timor situation. Um, Tiananmen Square, while it wasn't successful, immediately transformed the situation in China. Uh, and you could go on and on. I mean, the, the, uh, um, the overthrow of, of four Latin American governments in the period around World War II, uh, let alone later on the Pinochet regime mm -hmm. in Chile, brutal dictatorship, mm -hmm. overthrown by nonviolence. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes kind of astonishing when, I mean, by what stretch of the imagination do we call nonviolence unrealistic when if you examined the conflicts of the 20th century, more than half of the successful overthrows of brutal regimes occurred using nonviolence. And, and the big cases of violence <laughs> were utter failures. The United States war against Vietnam, Mm -hmm. uh, all the, the, the US, French in Algeria, yeah, weapons sales to all these dictators to prop them up that end up backfiring mm -hmm. on us, like are our, our putting the Shah in power in Iran and then right. arming him to the teeth and then having the people overthrow. Exactly. And he was overthrown nonviolently by the students in the, right. in Tehran. So uh, there, and you meant there's a uh, there was a coup in the Soviet Union <clears throat> when when the Soviet Union was transitioning. Right. Tell that yes. story if you could a just kind of A group of generals briefly. decided that Boris Yeltsin was going too far and abandoning things that they held dear. Probably the bottom line was they were going to lose some power if this yeah. con continued. And so they, they decided to, to say, we're taking over the government. Um, we're, we are now in power. This is around what, 1990, 91, someplace? Right. Someplace around there. And um, <coughs> uh, they had four million troops, thousands of tanks, thousands of planes, and about a hundred, well, actually several tens of thousands of protesters. It, it, like any protest, it sort of varied how many people were actually surrounding the White House, which is the name of their parliament building, to protect the government. And all of those tanks and all of those planes and all of those troops could not find a way to break through and capture that building, that symbol, and put those generals in power and allow their coup to succeed. The coup failed not because of a violent resistance, which probably would have played into their hands, yeah. but it failed because people used their truth, their courage, their bodies, their dignity as their weapon. And that was a more powerful weapon than all those guns and mm -hmm. tanks and troops. Mm -hmm. Amazing story. And people keep saying, well, yeah, but it won't work against like Hitler. Give well, that, it, tell, tell us about that one. There's an interesting story. Um, after any war, any decent military, and ours is a well-developed well military, 
will get will take its brightest strategists, its uh, the colonels and the and the generals that really had figured out effective ways of dealing with the enemy and put them in charge of writing up after action reports, they call them. And there were literally walls of them. <laughs> I mean, shelves and shelves of these. They would interview the German generals systematically to discover everything they could about how that war went and what we can learn from it to be able to fight mm -hmm. more effectively uh, in the future. And one of the surprises that came out of this, and these are all military people that did the interviewing, was that the military, the generals in the German army admitted that they were kind of baffled. They were, they were amazed that they had a lot easier time dealing with, let's say, the partisans in France or the guerrillas in Yugoslavia under Tito than they did the nonviolent resistance in Bulgaria or Norway or Romania or Denmark. That that nonviolent resistance was was more effective. In fact, to the point that the German leadership in Denmark, we have the cables that they were sending back to Berlin toward the end of the war saying, let's just get out of here. Let's leave. We're, we're spending more energy trying to control these people and get them to produce food or you know, manufacture goods or whether we're, we're putting more energy in than we're getting out mm -hmm. in foodstuffs and, mm -hmm. and uh, production. And uh, the nonviolent resistance across the society on all kinds of different levels was just bringing the most powerful military machine of the times mm -hmm. to its knees. So it really did work against the, <laughs> it worked uh, the, against the, the, the Nazis. And one of the, one of the photos we'll be showing in a moment here is, is the King of Denmark riding his horse through downtown Copenhagen, which he would do uh, as a way of uh, showing that the, the Danish people still had their dignity and um, he was still the king. And so what if the Nazis were trying to occupy them, the Danish people were still in charge in this way? Because you're always, with nonviolence, you're always in charge. You always have your dignity and your power, even if somebody else is trying to oppress you. Because what the nonviolent person does is they change the rules of the game. Right. And so that's what the, when you said the German generals were saying that they were baffled by this nonviolent resistance, is because they didn't know how to play that game. And the people had changed the rules of the game. And so here's the Danish king riding his horse through the town, through, through the capital, Copenhagen, as if nothing had happened. And, and you, could, you could see in the photograph that, that as the, the other Danes were going along, they were like thrilled because they knew that they still had their dignity left. I mean, the same with the, uh, the students sitting in, uh, in the, on the lunch counters. Um, We've had police or newspaper reporters say afterwards, you know, sometimes years afterwards, they would say, you know, our first reaction was, like, who do these people think they are? I mean, and, and assume that this was just a passing fad. Mm -hmm. But just sitting down and not doing anything, being dignified, being well-dressed, mm -hmm. clean cut, um, yeah. it, it uh, broke the, the sort of dynamic of the violent situation right. and allowed... Uh, change to occur. And, and they did a lot of training so that they could prepare to deal with being taunted, being spat upon, being hit, right. assaulted, uh, and, and maintain their nonviolence and their dignity throughout. Right. Um, in the, in the um, American Revolution, we, we think about the Revolutionary War, but you have a different right. take on it. And I read stuff on it in... Right about 30 years ago now that I thought, whoa, this is an eye-opener. Tell My whole tell life I, I believed the history books depicting that the war, the, the revolution was won by a war. And no less than Alexander Hamilton, who was no radical uh, at the time, admitted in, in letters later that the war was actually mostly won before the fighting started in 1776 by the nonviolent resistance of the, of the colonialists um, the colonists, uh, the, you know, opposing the Stamp Act, the Boston Tea Party, mm -hmm. um, the, the other taxes that the British were doing. Well, they set up parallel institutions. Exactly. They just ignored the British court systems that were operating in the, mm -hmm. in the colonies. And they said, we'll just create our own court system that's our own indigenous court right. system, and we'll just boycott the British one. Right. So par creating parallel institutions right. is a classic form of nonviolent and, resistance. And so you ask, like, well, where did this m sort of one-sided perspective on our own history come from? Well, it was really written up the next time we had some external threat where people wanted to use military power 
And so at that point, they interpreted our history as one in which military power was successful in the revolution. So that's what we've got to use now in 1812 mm -hmm. or 1840 or 1860, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And it, so it was really a kind of a propaganda tool. <laughs> yeah. so, so let's talk just a bit uh, uh, about some of the range and the varieties of nonviolent actions because people think, you know, what, what you see in the press is there's a demonstration in the streets or somebody's getting arrested for sitting in a doorway or blocking a road or something. But there's a much wider range of nonviolent actions and, and settings and circumstances in which people can use nonviolence. I wonder if we could mention that. Uh, right. Uh, and, and, well, and pretty, pretty tight on time on each sure. of these because there's so many that we could right. say. Well, um, one, one thing that's become a feature of protests in the United States, this is one in Latin America against the Macadora system, uh, the worker, you know, workers working in factories owned by the United States, uh, using creativity, using, um, in this case, puppets or art or other kinds of things. Um, uh, in India, there's been several struggles over big dams that flooded out whole series of villages. 100,000 people could get flooded out. And here these women just stood in a line across the, the, uh, the river that, as it was rising to protest the flooding of this river valley that would basically put them out of business and, and deprive them of their livelihoods and of their homes and their, the places where their ancestors were buried, etc. cetera. Um, or, uh, I don't know, there's a wonderful exhibit that uh, one of the major pacifist groups has put together for this war of just a visual symbol of all of the people who have died so far in the war with Iraq. And it's an extremely powerful experience to walk through this collection of crosses. There's another group that has boots representing each of the soldiers. And to just see those thousands of, of objects. Uh, and it becomes also a bridge between the people that support the war and those that oppose it because it's honoring those people at the same time is it, that it's asking, let's look at what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. So the, the range of issues can include things like economic matters, environmental matters, as well as war and peace, right. uh, human rights. All, there's a wide range of subject areas, right. plus a wide range of, of actions, uh, including artistic things, symbolic representations. I know Gene Sharp, uh, who has done a lot of, he's probably the preeminent scholar on this uh, topic, has written a three volume set. This is the thinnest of the three, uh, uh, The Politics of Nonviolent Action, in which he details 198 different kinds of methods. Uh, and, and then there are way more than that, because he wrote this book in the 1970s, and there are way more than that. Sure. Uh, but people have done such, you know, all kinds of creative Things. Well, there was a case just lately in Africa where women wanted to protest oil company exploitation of their land, and they went out and did a nude protest. Right. Um, I mean, there's just a lot of different things. Um, so it, it's beyond the civil rights movement, beyond war. It's all kinds of these other issues and, and uh, many different things. Part of the nonviolent methodology includes what Gandhi called the constructive program, and, and he said that that was actually the largest part of his work was the constructive program that instead of just narrowly focusing on national independence from Britain, it was creating the alternatives, creating the new society, helping villages become self-sufficient so they could have decentralized economics and, and an economic system that made sense at the village level, the people to people level, um, right. and working to improve people's health care and nutrition right. and and all that stuff was part of the nonviolence movement so that the people of India would themselves be transformed and not just get rid of the, the elite from Britain and install an elite that was from India because right. that's still that same hierarchy. So exactly. it was very transformative. And he says that the constructive program was, was the major part of his movement. Right. Yeah. So. And he, uh, he, he embodied it by spinning thread right. every single day right. um, so that anybody that came to visit him, he would be spinning away. And yeah. so his words could be about whatever they were asking about. But the visuals, which sometimes are more powerful, yeah. were the way to break the back of British imperialism 
is to take charge of our own economy, right. is, to go, is to recover traditional crafts and traditional methods of sustaining yeah. ourselves. Yeah. So we don't need to buy stuff that's made by giant corporations or, or Chinese uh, sweatshop labor or sold at Walmart. Um, yeah, really not, I, when people talk with me about what, you know, about nonviolent action and, and being an, uh, an activist, I say that, that more than 99% of peace activism does not involve marching in the streets. It has a tiny, tiny, it's a way less than 1%. The overwhelming majority is talking with people, engaging folks and looking at possibilities, connecting people with each other, uh, updating mailing lists. I mean, there's just so many parts to it. And one of the things that I like about nonviolence as opposed to the, the military, the, the domination model, is that with nonviolence, everybody can participate. Right. The, these, these violent revolution kinds of things, that's for tough young macho guys who think that they're the elite and the vanguard. But nonviolence is something that, that historically, all around the world and throughout history, you can do that no matter how old you are, no matter whether you're a woman or a man, kid, elderly, mm -hmm. disabled. Right. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. You can do it no matter what your job is, no matter everything. I mean, there's a role for everybody in nonviolence. And so it's a flat system. It's a, it's a hierarchical free zone. Right. And you're creating a, an egalitarian, inclusive society that, right. that where everybody's part of the solution. Whereas these violent revolutions, you have a few macho guys on top, and they end up, and if they, they prevail, guys. <laughs> as guys, you bet. And, and tough guys, and often ruthless guys, and when they end up with a new society, it's those same tough, ruthless guys on top. Whereas a nonviolent revolution, you're sowing the seeds of an inclusive, in right. egalitarian system. So it's just a huge, uh, a huge range of things. The, there, uh, both of us know this saying that says, if your only tool is a hammer, you'll treat every problem as if it were a nail. <laughs> and that's what this militarism does. You know, the, the amount of money in our federal budget that goes for militarism is so huge that uh, we, we treat everything that comes along as if it were something that could be solved by military means, and, and it's just the wrong tool to use. Right, right. Uh, and it's amazing how durable and how deeply rooted those violent or those reactive kind of instincts are in us. And I've, I've finally concluded that I, I have to deal with myself and not just the problems out there. And I've been involved in a, in a multi-year project to try to change the way I, even the way I talk to people, the way I relate to people. And the, the workshop is called How to Be a Bridge in a World Full of Walls. And the rules are like, they fit on a po postage stamp practically. It's a, the, the handout is a this small card like the size of a business card. And it's very simple things like listen more than you talk and ask more questions than you give your answers. Respect the other person. Don't speak first. Um, you know, when you do speak, you know, speak with kindness and think of the humanity of the other person. And it's astonishing how, how it changes things. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, you, the, you'll respond in this way that your opponent will, will come back once or twice more. And af after just a couple of exchanges, all of the steam has just gone out of the fight. In fact, they often look as baffled as those German generals were about the Danish and the, and the, the Norwegian and the Bulgarian resistance. And uh, suddenly the whole exchange is on a different plane. Yeah. We, we have the case here in Olympia where recently uh, a little group of Nazis came to town to hold a little rally. And there was only eight of them, eight or nine of them. And we had people here in town who thought, well, what we should do is go out, get a whole lot of us, and try and shout them down. And I thought, no, that's just that's playing their game. Right. I don't want to have the kind of community where, where people who disagree with each other try to shout each other down and prevent people from having free speech. I want to have the kind of community where we change the dynamics of the game. So what I'd like to see when they come back again is, and they've said they'd come back in, in early July, what I'd like to see is the kind of thing that some other communities have done where you say you, you do a big outreach like they do for these hunger walks and dance-a-thons and stuff where we pledge so much a mile or so much or whatever. And in this case, what people have done in other communities is they have folks pledge to give to human rights groups you know, so much money for every minute that the Nazi rally, rally lasts. And then 
the longer they rally, the more money we raise for human rights groups, you know, and in some cases, the, the Nazis or the Klan or whoever in various right. communities have actually canceled their event yeah. rather than have thousands of dollars raised right. for human rights. And that's so a crucial... It, it changes, it's creative, it's nonviolent, and it changes the, the, the way the game is played, changes the power dynamics, right. rather than take the bait and just escalate it to exactly. more polarization. Because they, they like polarization. Right. Right. And what nonviolence does is it changes the, the relationships. And the planning involves creativity and uh, humor and uh, uh, you know thinking outside of the box rather than you know here's the opponent here's yeah. us how can we crush yeah. them <laughs> yeah 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 so um, one, one of the other things I think that's a, a principle that we haven't exactly mentioned yet is in nonviolence we recognize the relationship between the ends and the means right. the traditional military thing says we want to have a peaceful world, and the way to have a peaceful world is for us to beat the crap out of other countries. Right. And it, you don't, you know, it's like, wait a minute, that's that's not logical. Uh, what nonviolence recognizes is that the steps that we take will result in getting to where our steps are taking us. And if we're if we use violent steps, we're going to end up at violent destinations. If we want to have a peaceful world, we have to use right. peaceful methods. If we want to have a world of justice and fairness right. and truth, then we have to use just and fair and true methods. Right. And, and, you know, it's up to us to figure out a way to communicate that in a way that makes it clear that we're not advocating meekness or powerlessness or being a doormat for right. the opponent. Right. Absolutely but not. rather jujitsuing them, you yeah. know, using their own their power own against them, yeah. um, uh, flowing around them like the water that mm -hmm. is more powerful than the rock, you know. Mm -hmm. And and it's it's counterintuitive, especially in a culture that is so wedded to mm -hmm. and so schooled in and so used to understanding the world in terms of one kind of power, yeah. which is the power over rather right than the power with, which is right. the basis of nonviolence. But if we think back to the, the best traditions of this country, we have this, this Jeffersonian model that says we the people have the power and, and we create this government to meet our needs. Right. And so we have right. the power. And now what we have, especially currently in the US, is, right. a, is a, a regime running right. this country that thinks they, they have all the power and right. they can spy on the people, abuse the people, oppress the people, and all kinds of stuff. But it's we, the people, who have the power. That's what Jefferson says. That's what all those founding mm -hmm. people who created this country say. And if we adhere to those traditions, then we can take the power back. Because if we withdraw our consent, they can't rule. I mean, this is what nonviolence does. And this is what some of the things are in, in, in the classic, uh, there's many examples we've talked about, is where people refuse mm -hmm. to allow themselves to be oppressed, and we take it back. Right. Um, let's see, we have other things that we want to check in about. I wanted to, um, <clears throat> um, I, I want to ask, why is it that the American people don't know these things? Hmm. Why, I mean, this is so obvious to us, and anybody right. who's done the reading or who's right. paid attention, unless we're boxed in by this other hmm. frame. Well, one simple way of addressing that question is to look at our media. Um, I've worked a lot with parents. Um, in fact, I did it as a way of preparing myself to be a better parent than I feared I would be at first. Uh, one of the assignments in between classes was to go home, put between the chairs in the television room a piece of paper that had a couple lines drawn down it, Every time there was a conflict, whether it was in a news program or a cartoon or a commercial or a comedy, mm -hmm. you put a mark on the paper. If that conflict was addressed violently or nonviolently or the middle column, if it was some mm -hmm. mixture of them. Mm -hmm. And of course, every single time we did it, mm -hmm. parents came back with this, oh my goodness, you know, like 95% of all of my marks are on the violent side. Mm -hmm. um, the average child graduates from high school having spent more hours in front of the television set than in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the depictions of, of conflict or violence in that medium mm -hmm. are portrayed uh, with this win-lose win, win kind of mm -hmm. mentality rather than a nonviolent mentality. 
And so no matter what you can do as a parent or as a teacher in conflict resolution classes, you have one one thousandth or one one millionth as much airtime to convey your message as these very sophisticated commercials and news programs and comedies and dramas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we've got we've to get a handle on our media or get a handle on the time that our children are spending mm -hmm. in front of the media as one of the steps toward that. Mm -hmm. So what, what, in what ways would you see, we're, we're kind of running tight on time, sure. I want to move ahead to a couple of, of practical applications about how we might apply nonviolence in our own time and place. And we've, we've talked about some historical examples. I wonder if you could uh, think about applications for nonviolent principles nowadays. Well, I, I tell you, the parenting has got to be one of the places where I have put a lot of energy into it. To not treat a child, first of all, as less than, than an adult. And it's deeply ingrained in our culture that children are, are, are objects of parents, not subjects in their own right. Mm -hmm. And to radically change that dynamic, to not believe that to respect a child means to spoil them. And I can tell you, it works. To, to withhold our impulse to punish a child who is quote unquote misbehaving, but instead to get down on their level mm -hmm. and to, to seek to understand what's going on with the child and in that way, respecting them and giving them the space to figure out what's wrong. Now, there are times when that's not possible, and there are very, very rare occasions where you simply have to intervene. But 99.9% .9 of the problems that you encounter with children have nothing to do with the hot stove or the moving car. Mm -hmm. They have to do with uh, an impatient parent. Mm -hmm. And to acknowledge that and to take responsibility for that, and it, the result is so much better. I mean, um, the children that are raised in that way are far more mature, far more able to handle conflicts. They're not, they're not triggered by conflicts in the classroom. Mm -hmm. The teachers regard them as, as, you know, amazing, and they often learn, have learned better by the time they get to school. They learn better in school. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just a really a mounting um, amount of evidence that says that there's a dramatically better way of doing something as basic mm -hmm. as parenting. Mm -hmm. I think about other applications, you know, that we have this criminal justice system where the United States, for probably several different reasons, imprisons people at a vastly higher rate right. than any other country on earth. Right. And if we're this country of freedom, why are we doing that? There's right. something going on, right. and we have this violent attitude toward right. people who break laws. And it's more of that knee-jerk, there are only two solutions. You either ignore the problem, yeah. which makes it worse, or you... You yeah. grab it and, yeah. you know, handle it in a violent right. kind of fashion, which frankly doesn't work. That right. third way really is the way out. And yeah. it's the way that all these other countries, I mean, you, when you travel in Britain or France or Germany or Sweden or Portugal or Spain, there aren't more muggings, there aren't more shootings, there right. aren't more crime, there isn't more crime, but mm -hmm. they spend, they have a third or a quarter as many people in jail as yeah. us. Why can't we yeah. stop and, and examine this? Yeah. And, well, they, they look at, at drug use as a public health issue, right. and we've framed it as a criminal issue. Yes. So they say, here's somebody who has, has a, a, a health problem we need to right. take care of, and we say, you've done something bad, we, got, we want to punish you and throw you in prison for years. Right. Right. I mean, that's just one example. Right. Uh, but it would be fun to, to think of what would a nonviolent approach to the criminal justice system be. Right. What would a nonviolent economy look like? Right. An economy that doesn't have the violence built in that ours does, mm -hmm. or uh, a nonviolent school system, and, you know, just case after case after case where, where areas where we don't commonly think about nonviolence or violence, but to look for what are the elements of violence in our economic system, in our school right. system, and so forth. Um, it'd be fun, fun to play with that. Um, uh, you look at, even at the federal budget, and you mentioned this earlier here about how much Right. How much is based on militarism, and and it shows something. There, you mentioned when we were talking on the phone. You mentioned this quote that, that Jesus had said, uh, "Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also." Right. And if you look at at where this nation puts our treasure right. in the military budget, and a tiny, tiny, tiny part for nonviolent right. methods. Yeah. In fact, we did a detailed analysis of the of the federal budget, 
And the numbers came right off of the White House website. Office Management Budget is, is part of the White House. And uh, our federal budget allocates 50 to 100 times more money for military solutions, violent solutions to international threats and security than to all of the nonviolent methods put together. And also that many more times than all of the um, uh, efforts to deal with the root causes of the problem. Mm -hmm. And we calculated that we could, with the money that we spend every three or four months in Iraq, we could eliminate world hunger. The billion mm -hmm. people that are hungry regularly throughout mm -hmm. the, the week and the uh -huh. year could, could eat and be fed and be full. Mm -hmm. um, for another months or so worth, we could eliminate several of the diseases that are ravaging uh, poor people in the world. Now, try to go, if you were a terrorist, mm -hmm. go into those neighborhoods and recruit people mm -hmm. to fight the United States. Um, people would say, go fly a kite. I mean, yeah. my sister uh, is going to school. My brother survived childbirth. My father got his disease cured and is now working. Um, right. you know, which would make us more secure? Right. Fighting for a few months in Iraq or ending yeah. poverty, in, yeah. you know, extreme it, poverty yeah, in the world, it, which is what yeah, that it, 25 billion from the U.S. and some yeah. equal amounts from a few other countries. Yeah, I want to put in, we have just about five minutes left for the program. Okay. I want to put in a plug for this wall of hope that you've done some really, really amazing work on. Uh, and yeah. I'm going to hold this up and just fan through some pages while you tell us pretty okay. briefly because we were We examined several close. hundred different ex different. This, uh, is, this is about 18 or 19 pages yeah. of, of uh, examples throughout S history. Stories like what we've talked about here, each with pictures. So we have about 500 pictures. We, about 100,000 young people have seen it and tens of thousands of adults in various conferences and, and events. It just goes on um, for page after page. I mean, I'm yeah. not going to fan through all the pages, it's, but it's It's familiar it's stories like Rosa Parks. It's stories that we're familiar with, but we don't think of as nonviolence. Uh, Hebrew midwives commit the first recorded act of civil disobedience when they uh -huh. refuse to obey the Pharaoh's order to kill the male babies is one of the first uh -huh. moments on the wall. Um, and it's amazingly inspiring to young people and old people alike. Uh -huh. Um, and everyone in between. So it's uh, a big, long display with yeah. these historical examples. Right. And it's, a, it's also a brochure. It's on our website. Um, it, it's, it, we've got about a dozen activities that work with it. So it's a whole okay. package of, uh, of things that have developed uh, from us and, and lots of other groups have contributed and ideas. I want to mention your website that it's on. It's okay. the Lutheran Peace Fellowship web, uh, website, which is www.lutheranpeace.org. Yes. And you can Thank go there you. and get the Wall of Hope. Right. Um, and we give away freely. You can download it and yeah. go to town with it. Yeah, yeah. And you use this how many times? Well, over 500 groups have used it in direct relation to us. And we estimate that there are probably an even larger number than 500 that have used it that we haven't uh -huh. heard of because we've distributed it so widely. We've printed literally 120,000 copies of the brochure that has about half of the events on the wall. Uh -huh. And... Uh, and we've, we've displayed the wall for groups that, you know, as I said, over 100,000 yeah. people have walked past it. And that so. gives hope to people when yeah. they see that nonviolence actually has a proven track right. record. Because the not average just... high school or grade school textbook in history will talk about generals and presidents a yeah. hundred times more than the Rosa Parkses and right. Martin Luther Kings. Oh. And we'll have, at the end of the program, we'll have some other websites. I won't read them here now, but at the end of the program, we'll have other websites for the National Fellowship of Reconciliation, for A Force More Powerful, which is this amazing book and the, and the video series, which the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation has. And we're doing, in fact, a series of video showings on this and discussions from uh, mid-February into uh, mid-April at the Olympia Library downtown. Right. So it's, a, it's an amazing collection of stories, of case studies of, of practical uses of nonviolence. Um, let's see, uh, do you have other, can you squeeze in some other, either a story or an example of something or a principle maybe that we haven't addressed? I know we've had to rush through, there's so much to say. Yeah. Um. Uh, I, I guess I've been amazed at the, um, the sort of warmth and humanity of movements that are based on nonviolence. So I think it's not denying yourself 
a, mm -hmm. a set of tools that seem effective in, the, in our history or mm -hmm. in the larger world, but it's actually embracing a much more interesting life, a much more creative one, mm -hmm. one that demands um, more creativity as well, but also one that, that is grounded in our connections with each other. And you, know, you ask anybody, whether they were rich or poor, at the end mm -hmm. of their life, um, what they valued the most in their mm -hmm. life. And they would not pick the high salaries or the days at the office or yeah. the honors, yeah. but rather those human connections. Yeah. And it's, it's actually going against the grain of our culture that says, for every problem, we have a product for you. You have a, you have a need, buy our product. Mm -hmm. um, and to step back from that myth and embrace what, what people throughout history, famous philosophers and everyday people have understood um, in some fashion, and that is that it's our human connections, and it's our art, and it's our humor, and it's mm -hmm. our delight in one another that is the real stuff of life. And that is also the essence of this dramatically different way of understanding conflict and violence in the yeah. world. I want to mention just very brief quotes. Uh, one is from Wally Nelson, who uh, died a few years ago. He was an African-American civil rights activist, a conscience objector in World War II. Uh, and he refused to pay his federal war taxes since 1948. He says, nonviolence is the constant awareness of the dignity and humanity of oneself and others. It seeks truth and justice. It renounces violence both in method and in attitude. It is a courageous acceptance of active love and goodwill as the instrument with which to overcome evil and transform both oneself and others. I think that's a great one mm -hmm. and a, another a uh, briefer one from my read uh, Maguire, a Nobel Peace Prize winner right. from Northern Ireland who did remarkable work there. She says, nonviolence is not for the elite few, it is for everyone to live. It's a way of life based on respect for each human person and for the environment. It is also a means of bringing about social and political change and resisting evil without entering into evil. It is a whole new way of thinking. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you for all the new way of thinking you've brought here on this program. And uh, uh, at the end, they'll run the credits with the uh, websites uh, that, where people can get a lot more uh, information. But it's just so good that there are practical, nonviolent alternatives out there that have been tried, they're proven, they have a track record. Uh, and when you look at, like you said, you know, the track record of violence, it really doesn't do very well at solving problems. Exactly. We have much better alternatives. Right. Uh, Gandhi said that our understanding of nonviolence was only at the very beginning stage and we can continue learning more and practicing what we learn um, and we can make a lot of progress when our uh, methods are as lofty as our goals. For information about a variety of peace, social justice and nonviolence issues, call the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation at 491-9093. We're all one human family and we all share this one planet and we can make the world a better place, but we all have to do our part and the world needs what you have to offer. Thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.